Good morning. My name is Jasmine Kieran. I'm a uh, legal advisor at the Center for Human Rights at the American Bar Association. I have a pleasure to welcome you all to this online event, Documenting War Crimes, a conversation with advocates. Um, it is important in this event to show the role of the civil society, human rights defenders and lawyers in this difficult and also dangerous work. In this event, we also wanted to see how international community can better support and assist these defenders in their efforts. I also would like to thank our partners in joining uh, to organize this, organize uh, this event, uh, including Truth Hound, Center for Civil Liberties, International Bar Association Human Rights Institute, International Partnership for Human Rights, American Society of International Law and Human Rights First. Now, I would like to introduce our moderator who kindly agreed to moderate this panel in spite of his very, very busy schedule. Wayne Jordash is a main uh, manager partner of Global Rights Foundation and internationally recognized expert in international criminal and human rights law. Wayne spent over 20 years in his area of law working really hard on international criminal justice. In the last several years, since 2015, Wayne extensively has been working and assisting uh, Ukrainian efforts on the ground, as well as in international area. So Wayne, please take the floor. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin, and thank you very much for this opportunity to moderate uh, this uh, panel, which I'm absolutely sure is going to be fascinating and informative in equal measure. It's an extremely timely panel, uh, given the events in Ukraine over the last month, which of course have been shocking, traumatic, unfathomable, horrific. I mean, I could go on with the adjectives. Quite rightly, as a consequence of these events and this um, aggression, there's been a plethora of governments, uh, especially regional governments from Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, and so on, the Human Rights Council, uh, the OSCE, um, and various uh, international lawyers who've rushed to create and implement or further investigations into the crime of aggression and into the undoubtedly many war crimes and violations of international law that are occurring in Ukraine and are being perpetrated by Russian forces. Quite rightly, I say, and no doubt very welcome, but uh, as those in this panel know, these are long overdue. Russia invaded Ukraine in early 2014, seizing Crimea. It then supported separatist movements in Donbass and took overall control over those separatist groups in order to seize and control the territory. So there's been an occupation in Crimea and there's been an occupation by proxy in the east of Ukraine since 2014. Those on this panel, and this is what's so fascinating, have been involved in documenting these crimes and violations since that time. They're not new to this uh, terrible game. They are, if you like, veterans of the documentation process. And as they are critical voices, which must be heard if uh, the present events are to be investigated, documented, reported upon, and accountability to be reached in due course. If the process, or sorry, if the principle of do no harm is to mean anything, then it's these experts which must be listened to. If the specialism of investigating and documenting these types of violations means anything, again, it's these experts that must be listened to. They've not only been working during this period, but some of them have been working in terribly difficult circumstances and sometimes risking their lives. And so that's another reason why we can learn a lot from these panelists. So without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, Roman Avramenko. 
He will speak about his work documenting war crimes as a human rights defender, and importantly, will recommend ways to protect human rights defenders in Ukraine and beyond. So over to you, if I can, Roman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wayne, and hello to everyone. Um, I'm the executive director of the Ukrainian NGO called Truth Hounds. Truth Hounds has been established back in 2014 after the Russian annexation of Crimea and invasion into the eastern, eastern Ukraine. Since then, we persistently have been documenting and monitoring international crimes, constantly traveling to the conflict-affected areas of eastern Ukraine and, on, and to Crimea with purpose to collect witness testimonies, with purpose to document, to pick evidence from the ground, to monitor, to film the crime scenes, to assess the damage to property, to film and measure the impact craters, the, sh the shrapnel traces, with purpose to in further investigate and point at the alleged perpetrator who committed the international crime or ordered to do so. Since 2014, Truth Hounds have conducted more than 100 field documented missions to Ukraine. We have investigated dozens of alleged perpetrators. We have interviewed several thousands of victims and witnesses of the international crimes. And gradually, as our expertise developed, we also focused on other countries affected by conflicts. So we were fully involved into the documentation process of the recent outbursts of hostilities in nagorno karabakh For example, we have conducted three field documented missions there with the same purpose to document international crimes. We have also been to Georgia to document violations in the occupied parts of the Georgia. We also looking at the other countries that are affected by the conflict. And later we also included in our scope training and mentoring other human rights groups in different countries who also want to document grave human rights violations. And also we have established very good relationship with national authorities, with investigators and prosecutors who investigate those crimes. We also have been fully involved in the cooperation with international authorities. We have made, I believe, seven submissions to the International Criminal Court with evidence of international crimes by this, by this day. I, I am also supposed to, to recommend ways to protect human rights defenders in Ukraine in, in, in their work. I would say that Ukrainian civil society here in Ukraine is very strong, united, and dedicated to the work it's the, they are doing. We can influence the state on the highest level. We can freely speak in the uh, walls of the parliament. We can enter the working group of the cabinet of the ministries. And it's really motivating and encouraging us in this job. And I will also say that we can protect ourselves inside the country. I have been involved in this project aiming at protecting human rights defenders and activists in Ukraine. So I, I could see and I can see that we can handle the threats that are arise inside the country. And unfortunately, we neighbor in Russia, which occupied our territories and which also has been committing international crimes and since then, war crimes, crimes against humanity for already eight years. And during these eight years, no single perpetrator of those crimes has been put to justice by international mechanisms. And that is that's really discouraging us. And this threat, human rights defenders, from Ukraine cannot resist. They cannot resist the oppression from the occupants. And this also has happened gradually. It, it, it has been unfolding for, for years already. When 
in 2015, Russians arrested Crimean human rights defender Emir Hussein Kupu. Everyone expressed their concern. And now there are dozens of human rights defenders that have been arrested and detained in Crimea and put behind the bars in, in Russia. When Russia, Russians prohibited my friend Taras Ibrahimov to enter Crimea for 35 years, no one seems to have noticed this. And I would ask who among the human rights defenders can enter Crimea now? And how many human rights defenders of human rights NGOs are operating on the non-government control of the Eastern Ukraine controlled by Russia? None. Consequently, the situation with violations of human rights in their territories is really appalling now. Using brutal force in combination with impunity has led us to the worst atrocities in Europe for, for more than 70 years that, that has been unfolding now in Ukraine. So answering the question, I see the only one way to protect Ukrainian human rights defenders in Ukraine. And I hope you will spread these words further. The only way to protest to protect Ukrainian human rights defenders in Ukraine is to help Ukrainian army defeat Russia. That would be the best contribution into the security of human rights defenders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roman. Um, very sobering words, especially to hear uh, them from a human rights defender. Um, let me now turn if I can, to Alexandra Matvichuk, um, for any like like Truth Hounds, uh, probably one of the most uh, famous uh, human rights activists in Ukraine. She heads the nonprofit organization, the Center for Civil Liberties, and is an active campaigner for democratic reforms in Ukraine and in the OSCE region. She has massive experience in organizing human rights activities. She is the author of a number of reports in which have gone to the UN, the Council of Europe, the European Union, the International Criminal Court, and in 2016 received the Defender of Democracy Award for exceptional contribution to the promotion of democracy and human rights from the OSCE missions. So um, as her CV suggests, um, Alexandra, as I said before, is one of those critical voices which we have much to learn from. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you very much for providing me a floor. Uh, since this new large uh, in the Russian invasion started in February this year, we restore our initiative Euromaidan SOS. We brought up several hundreds of volunteers throughout the country and started to work on several directions. One is of the important direction is documenting war crimes. And we uh, gathered testimonies of victims and witness of deliberate challenge on civilian object and critical civilian infrastructure, as well as civilian populations. Also together with other human rights organization, we created a global initiative tribunal for Putin. And since uh, uh, 24 February, we jointly documented each episode in each region of Ukraine in chronological order. So what we see for current moment, we see that war crimes, which is Russia committed, have systematic and large scale character. We see that Russian deliberately now provide distinctions between military and civil population. And has led us to two conclusions that Russia, that, um, there, such actions are not justified by any military necessity and Russia is simply using war crimes as a method of warfare. And second, that intensity of such war crimes unfortunately is increasing. And for us as for human rights defender and human rights lawyer become a question, not only how to properly document it, all these war crimes, but what we can do to stop it what we can do to prevent a new war crimes and its victims to emerge. And second direction, which we do jointly, it's international advocacy. I will provide you two examples. We have now a huge problem with illegal displacement of Ukrainian citizens to the territory of Russia. Uh, 
uh, because uh, Russia, uh, for all this uh, period, uh, don't provide permissions to International Committee of Red Cross to, to open humanitarian corridors. We had only once when Russia provides such permission to ICRC and to open humanitarian corridors from Sumy to Lubny. And today we expected that the second uh, cases uh, uh, will, will, will be um, entered into force, but we will see uh, is it happen or not. In, is it why a lot of peoples in Mariupol, in Chernihiv, Volnavakha and other cities and settlements um, spent weeks in bomb shelters without food, water, electricity, heating, medical care. Instead of providing humanitarian corridors, Russia illegally displacement people to the territory of Russia from Mariupol, from Gastomil, from Volnavakha and other cities. I, when I spoke with their relatives and with some people who were illegally displaced, uh, they told that they have no choice. They have an uh, option or to stay and die or to go to Russia. And this um, pro so-called proposals was accomplished with the disinformation campaign. They were told that Ukrainian cities have no place to accept them. Uh, on March 21, the Office of the UN Refugee Agency in Moscow signed a partnership agreement with the Russian Red Cross. And it was uh, provoke a huge surprise from Ukrainian human rights defenders because Russian Red Cross uh, was um, collaborate uh, and support Russia in this forceful deportations of the Ukrainian citizens to the Russia. And if UNHCR failed to address uh, this uh, force illegal displacement, it's not good decision to legitimize, legitimize such practice with cooperation of Russian Red Cross, which is under total control of Kremlin. In this regard, we published our joint appeal um, and ask uh, International Committee of Red Cross, who, all, who plan to open office in territory of Russia, to focus on this problem, to help uh, people uh, without documents, to restore their documents, and to, uh, to use as a main function of his work on the territory of Russia, uh, to assist uh, to, uh, of, uh, Ukrainian citizens to return to Ukrainian territory as quickly as possible. Second examples of, of problem which we try to solve from the frame of international advocacy is uh, a practice of uh, political persecutions in occupied territories of, which were occupied by Russian troops after February this year. We receive appeals from civil society activists and their relatives who suffered from threats, physical violence, enforced disappearances, arbitrary detention and other forms of persecution in Melitopol, Kherson, Berdyan, Kakhovka, Slavutich, and other cities and settlements. Among them, there are local government officials, journalists, religious leaders, volunteers, and other civil society activists. It's a deliberate policy uh, because Russian troops try physically eliminated people with active stand who could peacefully resist the occupation in order to obtain and to save a quick control over the occupied region. For current moment in our list, there is uh, 116 people uh, who were enforced disappearances or illegally arrested on these occupied territories. Among them, 16 women. Uh, uh, we have uh, for on this list 28 representatives of local authorities, uh, three religious leaders, journalists, uh, volunteers who provide humanitarian assistance to people or uh, try to help people to evacuate from the destroyed cities, and also active citizens who repeatedly uh, go into a peaceful uh, protest in the occupied cities. Uh, this, this is the same practice which we have observed in Crimea and Donbas in 2014, and that's why we published an um, open appeal and asked international organization that we need their international presence on Ukrainian territories, which is temporarily occupied. Uh, not only there we need their presence, we need international presence and monitoring in the war zone during this wild evacuation. We need them to work on the ground together with us. Because for current moment, UN agencies provide this uh, documentation and monitoring distantly. But we ask them to return to, to uh, uh, Ukraine, to the uh, place uh, where we are working for current moment, 
and to stand with us and fulfill their mandate. And uh, also oh, the third direction which I want to present quickly is uh, which uh, human rights defenders and human rights lawyers are doing for current moment and provide different services to victims of uh, war crimes. And uh, some of them we are doing with cooperation with international organization like uh, provide psychological assistance to victims of sexual violence and other kinds of assistance. Also now we try to um, cooperate with the lawyers, uh, Ukrainian lawyers networks in order to provide law assistance to relatives of people who were uh, kidnapped uh, in the occupied territories. And uh, we had uh, uh, agreement with different psychological center to provide them psychological aid. But one of focus of our work is also to support civil society to preserve in Ukraine. And here there is illusion that a lot of civil society are fleed from country or to the more safer region in Ukraine. But I must admit that uh, civil society actors are present now in different hotspot and do their work in a very dangerous situation. And if you want to help us, it's not uh, enough to ask us to evacuate because it's our choice and we decided to remain. I'm in Kiev now. My colleague Roman uh, spoke from Kiev region, which uh, our battles are going on for all this time. Uh, we ask us to help us to resist. And in order to do it, uh, it's not enough only to work in the frame of international organization, uh, but also to work on the level of uh, national governments, participants of the UN system. Uh, we ask you to make our voice louder. Uh, we need a real uh, tough sanctions which can frozen the ability of Russian economy to feed this war. Because when we go into details, we will see that Ben of Swift are covered only several Russian banks. Among them, there is no Sberbank, which is the biggest bank of Russia. So we ask uh, to provide advocacy and public demonstration with appeal not to the Putin, but to the national governments who had to stand with Ukraine and provide proactive measure to stop Putin and this war. And last, what I want to finalize my speech, unfortunately, Russians uh, in, ma in majority supported this war. And this is proved by the recent Levada Center um, sociological polls, which was uh, which uh, was the center is uh, was uh, in sociological agency, which was labeled by foreign agency in Russia. But there is a tiny minority, Russian human rights defenders and other activists who still protested and risked their lives and face with uh, real criminal prosecutions and can be imprisoned for 50 years only for their votes and for their public uh, position. Uh, people in uh, other countries has much more instrument to help us and to make our voice vocal. So we ask you to, to provide this advocacy efforts to support Ukraine, which now in the forefront of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And we are ready to fight and to continue uh, our resistance for the country, for the people and for the values of free world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, so some very clear messages coming out there from Roman and Alexandra uh, to de defeat Russia militarily, to defeat them economically, and to amplify, amplify those voices from within the country globally to keep up the pressure, as well as doing all this documentation and human rights work uh, quite a uh, feat. Let me turn now to um, an international expert who has Alex Presanti, who's been working again since I think 2014, 2015, working with some of these human rights uh, defenders and human rights activists. Um, he's an international criminal law expert, a partner in global diligence. He provides legal advice and assistance to individuals, uh, non-governmental organizations and public authorities on human rights, international criminal law, sanctions and universal jurisdiction uh, mechanisms. He specializes in evidential analysis in large complex cases 
and strategic litigation. Alex Presante, uh, over to you to talk about the work that you've been doing um, since 2014. Thank you very much, Wayne. Greetings, everyone. Thank you very much, Roman and Alexandra, for your interventions and uh, to Wayne for, for moderation. Um, and to the ABA for organizing this event. Now, the organizers have uh, asked me to talk about first my work uh, in supporting uh, war crimes documentation and accountability in Ukraine, the role of international community in this process more broadly, and uh, to provide some recommendations for the international community. So first, uh, a little bit about my, myself and my, and my work. Um, as Wayne has said, I've been engaged uh, in Ukraine since about mid-2014, just after the um, Maidan uh, protests. And uh, I first arrived in, in, in Ukraine, in Kiev, um, when uh, the International Federation for Human Rights, FIDH, asked me to assist um, civil society led at the time. Uh, this group was led at the time by our speaker, Alexander uh, uh, they've asked me to, to, to assist civil society in, in starting to document the violence that, that took place during the Euromaidan uh, protests and to frame a complaint to the ICC. And in the process, I became acquainted with um, Ukrainian human rights defenders, a uh, plethora of human rights organizations, and watched as a coalition uh, was created to document um, war crimes and other violations that uh, were taking place in, in Crimea and in Eastern uh, Ukraine. I helped to establish um, a Truth Hounds, uh, of which uh, our speaker Roman Abramenko is currently the, uh, the director. Uh, I helped to build a society capacity to investigate war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, I created uh, or helped to create an analytical framework because all of this, all of these efforts are, of course, collaborative. We 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 did it all together with uh, with with local civil society, and that's very important to emphasize. We created an analytical framework to to, to analyze all this uh, information, and since 2014, we've been turning this evidence into dossiers and briefs, which have been filed to the International Criminal Court prosecutor, um, requesting uh, investigations into in, in, into various crimes to uh, domestic prosecutors in Ukraine, but also in um, various other countries like Germany and Holland. Um, and the Scandinavian countries. We've also put together sanctions uh, requests uh, and represented victims um, before the European Court of uh, Human Rights, specifically in, in, in relation to the situation in Crimea. And the briefs were focused, uh, first of all, on sort of thematic areas. Uh, so for example, and I'll just give some examples, not, not an exhaustive list, but for example, we looked at sexual violence in places of detention uh, together with the east ukrainian uh, center for, for, for civic uh, initiatives uh, we looked at indiscriminate bombardment of, of civilians with truth hounds we put a brief together uh, on the persecution of activists uh, in crimea with again with truth hounds but also with crimea sos um, then we <clears throat> we started putting together briefs we started collecting what we call linkage evidence or attribution evidence uh, and started putting briefs <clears throat> together uh, targeting specific perpetrators which we believe should be <clears throat> arrested uh, and, and, and indicted by the ICC. So currently I'm doing all of the above um, again with, with, with civil society and uh, also working with Russian experts on uh, chain of command, Russian chain of command and, and, and military units um, uh, to reinforce our uh, briefs on uh, on perpetrators and, and, and uh, attribution. Uh, we're also organizing, uh, together with IPHR, we're organizing screenings uh, of potential victims and witnesses among the millions of refugees who are streaming across Ukraine's borders. So to sum up, my role is really to, to, to help to, to 
to frame and steer uh, civil society investigations uh, using the framework of international law to ensure that uh, evidence is collected in a way that it is ad admissible in, in, in future uh, criminal proceedings uh, and also to turn evidence into compelling narrative uh, seeking accountability as well as international focus. So as to the role of the international community in this process, now, as Wayne said in the beginning, um, of course, I'm encouraged by the flurry of activity and enthusiasm from the international community, from international lawyers uh, for justice in, in, in Ukraine. But I must also note that for eight years, the international community did very little while Ukrainian towns and villages smoldered uh, from bombardment, while 15,000 people died, um, and while Russian authorities terrorized uh, minorities in, in, in Crimea. Most notably, uh, I think, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which took eight years to decide whether or not to open an investigation uh, into uh, the situation in Ukraine, and thereby extinguishing, in my opinion, any deterrent effect that an ICC investigation could have had uh, in the present situation. And now, of course, the ICC has launched an investigation, arguably when it became politically expedient to do so. So we must recognize the ICC for what it is. It's symbolic justice. Uh, it represents an inter the international community's desire to live in a safer and fairer world. It is not and will never be the final word uh, on justice in Ukraine or any other conflict. And I think that as international civil society, we have to support the International Criminal Court uh, and work with it by providing it with evidence, by providing it with access to, to, to witnesses and to, to victims. But also we have to be realistic and accept its limitations so the main task of delivering justice for victims in Ukraine falls on domestic courts. First and foremost, we're talking about Ukrainian courts and Ukrainian uh, prosecution. Um, and residually, other domestic courts in other domestic jurisdiction under the principle of universal jurisdiction. Our role as international civil society is to support all these efforts by boosting their capacity to take on this huge volume of potential cases by donating resources uh, to be, uh, for them to be able to, to, to take these cases, to prosecute them fairly and independently, by documenting and preserving evidence for future trials. The ICC is of course documenting, the, the UN is of course documenting, but uh, there is a, a big role for, for civil society to continue with the documentation and preservation of evidence um, because this conflict involves huge number of central incidents. And then, of course, in tracking perpetrators and their assets all over the world for years and years to come. The international community should work together to distribute these resources where they are needed. And by resources, I mean not only money, of course, but also expertise. For example, Right now, seasoned investigators are needed. Uh, analysts are needed. Forensic architects are, are in high demand. At some point, also soon, we will need experienced prosecutors and lawyers to help to build cases. And I have to emphasize that as what, what, from what we have learned, um, in the past eight years, but, 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 but maybe longer uh, in, in the whole history of international criminal law. This is a long, long process. Um, justice will not be served in the next 12 months or 24 months. We're looking at decades before justice can be served. So I hope that in the long run, we can serve justice for the victims of Ukraine and for the world, I hope, if the dream of an effective international justice is still alive, then we need to really think about reforming or possibly replacing the International Criminal Court with something that goes beyond 
symbolism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you for reminding us of the importance of the ICC, but um, its limitations and for turning us again to the absolute essential nature of civil society work and the call to international experts to support that work and try to bring justice back to where it belongs at the local level. Uh, let me now turn to our last panelist, um, Professor Michael Newton, who will not need introducing to many of you, um, priority uh, over many years and understands the essential need to combine uh, national experts and international experts in order to achieve accountability. He's an expert on terrorism, accountability, transnational justice. He's published over 90 books. I should have said this at the beginning. And he's professor of the practice of law, the professor of the practice of political science at Vanderbilt. Uh, he has um, given experts in witness testimony in terrorism related trials. Uh, is it's on the council list at the IC at large for war crimes in the US State Department from January 1999 to August 2002. So over to you, Professor, to talk about the work that you've been doing um, to support civil society in Ukraine. Honestly, I feel humbled to be here in comparison to the work that other people have done. Uh, but that, I, actually, I think that's the, that's the primary place I'd like to start. I like the way Wayne summarized the first two interventions. We have to win militarily to have any hope of changing the dynamic to achieving actual justice as opposed to the facade of justice. I, I, I agree with the premise that we have to win economically to maintain pressure, to, to, to get people into the dock and to... to collect the, the correct appropriate actions. But I wanna just simply say, I think it's non-negotiable for the future of humanity and for the future of the region, and I'm not trying to be dramatic about it, but for the very future of this entire discipline of both human rights, but also the connection to the international criminal regime, it's non-negotiable that we have to win legally. Uh, you know, we're in a very different place than we were at, as we all know, in, in the development of the system since the end of World War II, if the system has any validity at all, we must, absolutely must win legally. And so that's kind of what I wanna focus on. I've been asked to uh, comment on three areas. What can the international community do? Uh, what can local political leaderships do and local government? And then, and then the big one for me is, what can we do with this partnership? Um, and I wanna start with the international community uh, has to redouble its efforts. Words are not enough here. It takes requirements, it takes actions, it takes very focused, laser-like support and assistance. Um, so let me give you just an example. The idea of technical experts was mentioned yesterday. I've spent almost the entire bulk of my career advising judges on the ground. Um, and it's so funny. A friend of mine one time said, I'll do London, you do Baghdad. Right? The international experts can't help from their armchairs. They've, we've got to get on the ground. We've got to have governments that facilitate that. Um, either a U.S. law, the Arms Export and Control Act, allows for technical assistance to judges. So the civil society that's on the ground can help be the, the fibers that connect technical expertise to the places and the people who need it in real time. It's not good enough to wait 10 years. I agree. Uh, I agree with Alex. The system is slow. It's cumbersome. We cannot wait five, 10 years to, to begin movement until things are perfect. We have to do this now. We have to do it in real time because at the risk of sounding melodramatic, this body of law is the common heritage of mankind, right? War crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity law, and the, the integrated architecture that we've developed, every country of the world has an interest in sustaining that and in maintaining it. And warfighters and human rights defenders have to work together 
but we also have to make those actions go beyond verbiage. Um, I had a judge one time say to me, quote, uh, we're in a battle, and if I don't fight and you don't fight, then who will fight? So we must, non-negotiable, fight militarily, but we must also fight legally with, with words and actions and deeds. Um, and so in that vein, you know, what can the international community do? To me, three things. Number one, absolutely maintain the law with respect to humanitarian relief and humanitarian convoys. And I see a lot of rhetoric, a lot of broken promises. You know, the Russians routinely targeted humanitarian relief efforts in Syria. They're doing the same thing in, in Ukraine. And there's generalized condemnation but I think we be, must be much more aggressive in, in drawing lines and in defending humanitarian defenders and humanitarian efforts. Now, what's that mean to us? A critical piece of that is in facilitating investigations on the ground. That's part of the humanitarian effort. It's part of justice. Um, when people are speaking with refugees, every refugee potentially has critical evidence. Even if it's nothing more than uh, the identification of a unit patch or um, the kinds of things that people were stealing from the civilian population that help establish systematic or widespread atrocities. Um, so to me, we absolutely must immediately as a political matter and as a legal matter, re resuscitate the, the, the sacred nature really of these uh, humanitarian efforts. Two is occupation law. And I totally agree with Alex and Roman, every speaker, that, that we have failed to uphold occupation law in a variety of ways since, since, since Russian occupation of those territories. And now's the time we're seeing the same trend continue of political persecutions, of misuse of domestic law. The cornerstone principle of occupation law is that the occupier in effective control of the territory has the legal obligation, non-negotiable, to preserve l'ordre et la vie publique, public order and safety, and rather than becoming the, the force for perpetrating those crimes, which is exactly what we're seeing, whether it's political officials, whether it's interruption with, with local law enforcement, whether it's persecution of journalists or persecution of human rights defenders, all those things are happening. And we're watching occupation law be destroyed before our very eyes. And we have to, with one uniform voice and one just absolute non-negotiable to me, that we re revitalize occupation law. And then lastly, I want to pick up on something that Alex said, but actually extend the thought, is the notion, you know, in, every, in many other settings, when we talked about justice, it's always been as an, as an aspiration whether it was the Balkan Civil War, we had the, the goal of justice, and so we had to create the Yugoslavia mechanism to do that. Rwanda, we had to create an ad hoc mechanism to do that. Uh, Sierra Leone, um, and I was on the, the, the UN planning mission for Sierra Leone. We had to create a new hybridized approach. Um, the only reason we have to create any new structure with respect to Ukraine is on the crime of aggression. And I'll say again, this common theme, if we believe that Article 2.4 of the UN Charter means something, we must move towards the creation of a separate structure to address aggression. And, you know, in my business, there's a lot of thought on how to do that. There's some ideas that are being bandied about, some good, some bad, some take more time, some take less time. But I think it's non-negotiable that we, we build a process for aggression. But I want to stress that we have processes for prosecuting these crimes. The ICC is merely the capstone uh, of, of an integrated system. These are grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. Every country of the world has universal jurisdiction. And we've reached the point where we can't talk about this. We must bring people to trial. And, and then what I'd say is that we have to galvanize international efforts at enforcement. And again, it's, it's past the time for talk. Now, what are the role of local officials? The role of local officials are to facilitate witnesses and evidence getting into the right courtroom, into the right place. That means keeping track of refugees, where they are, who they are, 
I had an interview one time, I was interviewing uh, a Kosovo Albanian in the context of the Milosevic crimes against humanity case. And she said to me, she said, what's the point, right? No one will ever help us. No one cares. No one will ever see justice. And I said to her, I said, ma'am, I can't tell you when, but if the law means anything, we will find a way to enforce it and against the people that we can enforce it against. And I will honestly tell you that her statement was a critical piece of evidence in the actual Milosevic trial. So local governments and local civil society have to carry that exact same message to the people with whom they're encountering. Um, the, the, the network is integrated. We can't do anything without the local advocates on the ground who are talking to people who are meeting victims' expectations on the ground immediately, but they have to convey that information to local governments and local, local officials who in turn have to coordinate in a synergistic way with international efforts. And that's really the last thing I wanna say, and I have lots of you know, things to say in response to questions. We've seen other settings where information is centralized. There's a huge collection effort. And then, you know, the ICC has done this in Uganda as only one example, uh, but I could give you other examples where information is provided and then it's withheld, right? And it's, it's, it's used only when that international organization believes it to be appropriate. Well, to me, that's the exact wrong approach. We have the, the opportunity here to create a new paradigm. In my view, civil society and the international collection efforts need to work together to validate an integrated and systematic approach. That means any country in the world, any court in the world that wants to persecute these folk, prosecute these folks, gets access to evidence. There's, there should be no withholding. There should be no institutional or, or foundational turf here. We have to all work together because everybody's evidence is important and everybody has a part in this. We cannot allow any single, whether it's a UN organization or whether it's the ICC or whether it's one government to withhold evidence for whatever reasons, for political reasons, for personality reasons. And I, and I wanna end by restating really what I think is at stake here. And, I, and I'm not trying to be melodramatic, but it really is the future of the law. We, the law, and occupation law and the validity of the Geneva Conventions will die before our very eyes if we don't stand fast to enforce them and to document these crimes. And otherwise we just become a laughing stock and human rights becomes, becomes the way the dodo bird or the carrier pigeons in the United States, a dream that once was and has now gone. And I don't think any of us who have spent our entire lives building this field want to sit back and watch that happen. But I will say to the international experts, the time for talk is past. We must get on the ground. We must build these systems. We must support judges. And we must support with very tailored expertise the local officials who want to build cases. And I'll end simply by observing that there's a world of difference between the political rhetoric of war crimes, which is totally appropriate, and the granular evidence needed to prosecute in a court of law. We must get very detailed at that level in response to requests. Um, and we've done this successfully in other settings, right? How do I prove the crime against humanity of persecution? Exactly how do I prove and, and bring together the evidence to prove forcible deportation, forcible disappearances, violations of occupation law, et cetera, intentional targeting of civilians. That's the granular case that must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And I just want to end by saying it's, it's so humbling to, to, to know these people, to work with them. We have to support them with every fiber of our beings. And, and I think the time for political opportunism and simple rhetoric is, is long past. And I'm, I'm sorry to take that time or sound so strident, but I really do believe the future of the law is at stake here. Now we are moving to the section on interventions, and I would like to give a floor to Lucia Seyfarth. She is the, uh, from your State Department Office of Glo Global um, Criminal Justice, and also currently is U.S. Mission to UN Human Rights Council. Lucia, please. 
Thank you very much. Um, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me. Let me know if not. Um, and, um, and as mentioned, I am currently with the US mission in Geneva, but my permanent position is uh, with the Office of Global Criminal Justice in DC. So um, I want to thank you first to the organizers um, for putting together such an important event and especially thank you to all of the panelists who are doing such crucial work on the ground. Uh, your courage is inspiring. Um, Throughout the 49th session of the Human Rights Council, the United States has repeatedly condemned Russia's brutal and premeditated and unjustifiable war against Ukraine. Um, and as you've all heard, based on information available, the US government assesses that members of Russia's forces have committed war crimes in Ukraine. Um, but as you've noticed, and, and as we all know, as, you, as you've noted, this condemnation is not enough. Um, we all know that no matter how this ends, even if Ukraine repels Russia's attacks or Russia suddenly decamps Ukraine, there cannot be lasting peace without justice for those affected by this horrific violence. In the Office of Global Criminal Justice, we're committed to using every tool available, including criminal prosecutions, to hold those responsible for human rights abuses and violations and violations of international humanitarian law accountable. Uh, we're currently working with the War Crimes Unit of the Office of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine, the Office of the Prosecutor General requested that we embed a team of international prosecutors on the ground in Poland to provide direct assistance, and we've already mobilized that team. Further, we welcome calls for states to explore options for accountability through domestic mechanisms, as well as the ICC prosecutor's announcement as an, of an investigation into alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in Ukraine. And I, I mention this because this is why I think your work is all so crucial. Documentation, evidence collection, bringing the realities of these crimes to light is absolutely essential to accountability efforts and therefore it's essential to peace. And it's also cr crucial to our work to the international community's message to Russia um, on, on the sort of rhetoric scale besides the legal angle uh, that these crimes are not tolerated, that those responsible for human rights violations um, and violations of international humanitarian law must be held accountable. When we're talking about the trials and the importance of justice, I think, you know, we've mentioned this and many of you have said this, but we have to be honest that this is this isn't easy. It's going to be a very long, hard road. And the realities on the ground in Ukraine, as you all know, will all too well are absolutely horrific. But I want to make sure to emphasize that you're not alone in this fight. Um, and the United States continues to stand with you. We will not stop. The Office of Global Criminal Justice will not stop in our work for justice for victims families, all of those affected by Russia's brutality, and we remain, remain committed to accountability for those responsible. We're honored to support you, honored to work alongside you in the service of justice. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Next um, on our list of intervention is Baroness Helena N. Kennedy. Baroness doesn't need any introduction here in this capacity. She kindly agreed to say a few words as a director of IBA, International Bar Association Human Rights Institute. Please, thank you, Baroness. Uh, Yasmin, it's lovely. It's lovely to see you here. And can I, I too, add my voice in paying tribute to our colleagues Roman uh, um, and uh, uh, and also Alexandra for the incredible work that they have done in the past and that they're doing in this terrible period of tragedy. Um, I, um, I, I, I just wanted to start by saying that um, it just, I wanted to, to reinforce some things that were said by, by Alex, um, um, first of all, talking about um, the inadequacy at times um, uh, um, of, of the international system that was established um, after the Second World War where our hopes over the years were great for those institutions that were created. Um, first of all, the International Court of Justice, of course, um, but more recently, the uh, International Criminal Court. Um, and, but both courts, of course, um, have considerable uh, uh, problems and, uh, and there are real reasons why uh, justice is delayed um, because the institutions are not working well enough and it's all too easy um, for um, uh, vetoes to be exercised, all too easy for um, uh, people to galvanize support in opposing um, in investigations and, and the like. So I, I, I wanted to, to, to 
support his call for something better. The problem is that our world is not in a place at the moment where something better is likely to be created, I have to say, um, because there are too many authoritarian governments around the world that have no interest in the securing of, uh, of, of justice um, and, uh, and whose regard for law is not great. And so when um, um, uh, Michael talks about uh, uh, the future of lobbying at stake, right, that, that law, law is under enormous pressures and international law particularly under enormous pressure just now. Um, and one of the reasons why is that there are too many um, political leaders in our world who have no regard for law. Now, um, I just want to um, emphasize what has just been said about the importance of securing justice if you want to have a lasting peace. And it's absolutely true. The heart yearns for justice and the people of Ukraine deserve justice. And we have to try to uh, ensure that justice is forthcoming. Now, one of the things is that there are all too many uh, lawyers who want to help you, the lawyers of Ukraine, uh, the human rights uh, uh, committed lawyers of Ukraine um, in your um, um, efforts to secure that justice for your people. And we want to be of help to you. I wanted just to tell you that um, the, the Prosecutor General has been active in uh, acquiring international support and we've heard about how she has um, sought the help of prosecutors of experience to be in Poland to gather um, evidence and so on. Uh, she also approached Amal Clooney and uh, Wayne uh, uh, Jordash will tell you that he and, uh, and Amal and myself, we all belong from the same stable of lawyers. We all belong to a, a particular set of chambers based here in the United Kingdom. And um, Amal Clooney um, is a very um, highly regarded international lawyer. And uh, she um, was approached by the Prosecutor General to, to help put together a team of people to work with um, Ukrainian lawyers to, to really try to um, galvanize a sort of uh, 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 and to strategize over a campaign around law. And, uh, and certainly um, Amal approached me um, at the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute um, to see if, if we might at any time when called upon make ourselves available and we will. We will absolutely be here available to um, anyone who needs help and support and any way that we can do that um, inside this international global uh, organization of lawyers. And uh, one of the things that, that we do is that, is that we, that we put our skills to work um, where you, we might, you might find it useful. One of the things that I wanted to urge when I spoke with Amal and when I met with the team of lawyers that she's putting together, and which yesterday I think was part of a press release put out by the Prosecutor General to say that this task force was coming into being was that um, that we might be able to help because with this we do so the sort of thing of creating something that for example could be circulated amongst your armed forces about the importance of Ukrainian armed forces um, not being tempted into in any way uh, um, uh, doing any harm to any, any Russian prisoner of war. Because the last thing, of course, that we want is that, uh, is that we give the opportunity to uh, Russia to turn the focus onto uh, Ukraine and to suggest that Ukraine has uh, fallen short in any way um, in its protection of, of, uh, of prisoners of war. Um, and of course, uh, Russians have been detained already, as we know from, from the Prosecutor General. So those sort of things we can help with, for example, um, providing training materials, we could create them for you, and, uh, and then some of the lawyers in Ukraine could um, work on them to make them appropriate, um, uh, put them into Ukrainian and circulate to people. But that sort of thing we can help with um, uh, at the International Bar Association. And as I say, um, Amal has asked that I join her with other lawyers on this task force. Um, but what's important, and I want to, to, to pick up something that was just said by, by Michael, which is that there, there shouldn't be any kind of, if you like, turf wars over who, who, has, who does what. It's very important that we, we, we strategize on this together and that we, um, and we work together and collaborate and make our skills available to anybody who needs them. Ukraine, Ukraine has its own wonderful lawyer and wonderful human rights activists. And you are going to be the people who on the ground are going to be gathering um, evidence. And of course, one of the things that you may find useful 
is having available to you material as to how to get the best sort of evidence together, because this has been a very, it's been a witnessed war. Um, and uh, and people themselves, citizens, have been recording on their iPhones the horrors that they've seen. And so much of that should be gathered together. One of the things that Amal Clooney has done is that she's spoken, uh, she's very, she knows very well um, the head of Microsoft, and she has got Microsoft to agree um, without charging, pro bono, uh, to, uh, to actually uh, serve as a technology partner to Ukraine um, uh, uh, and to the task force to provide assistance free of charge to secure, analyze and share evidence of international crimes, the crimes that you've all been discussing um, with the appropriate authority so that they can be used in, in, in prosecutions. Um, we also should be really reminding nations of their, their own uni, you know, universal jurisdiction, where people who will flee, who have, you know, have blood on their hands, have to be prosecuted wherever. And all of our nations have to commit to bringing to justice those who have been responsible for these war crimes that we've all been witnessing um, on our television screens. And my God, have we been witnessing them. So um, uh, I also wanted to, to, to mention this issue of the crime of aggression. Um, of, of Russia seeking to just move in on Ukraine itself is a crime um, and one of the fundamental crimes that was dealt with at the Nuremberg trials. And so um, uh, how speedily could a, an independent tribunal be put together by the United Nations as was done uh, in relation to Milosevic and so on, as was done in relation to Rwanda, as was done in re relation to Sierra Leone? Is that, is that an avenue to pursue as well as um, the uh, International Criminal Court, which may take a rather long time. I don't know whether it would be faster, and there are different um, uh, models of how such a tribunal uh, could be put together. So uh, I'd, I'm here really to say um, I want to um, uh, pay tribute to all of you who are working on this. Justice is an essential element in, in procuring a long-term peace and, uh, and the safety for, for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. And we as lawyers in the international community have to put ourselves at your service. Thank you very much, uh, Baroness Kennedy, for that um, timely intervention and for reminding us that coordination um, is perhaps the watchword of the day. Um, plenty of help around, um, but the dangers of not coordinating is um, real and present. If I can just um, remind um, the listeners that a witness or a potential witness in the Cox's Bazaar um, following the deportation of 600,000 Rohingya in August, of seven, uh, August 2017 ended up being interviewed, I think, 32 times by investigators, by journalists, and so on. And so we can see the dangers there of a lack of coordination. So um, moving finally to our last intervention, Volodymyr Chekrin, who's the deputy chairperson of the board of the Crimean Human Rights Group, another very involved um, and very experienced uh, human rights activist. Um, over to you, Volodymyr. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to take uh, a few words about uh, Crimea and our work. Uh, we work uh, on documenting human rights violations and war crimes in Crimea since 2014. Uh, probably all members of our team are Crimeans who had to leave Crimea after the occupation. And unfortunately, now we see the consequences of the militarization of Crimea, which was documented by us. and. Uh, a uh, few submissions to the International Criminal Courts uh, on that issue uh, were uh, submitted uh, by our team. Uh, I want to, you to remind that uh, more than uh, 34,000 uh, Crimean residents were illegally conscripted uh, to the uh, Russian armed forces uh, since uh, 2014. And uh, parents of those who were uh, drafted in autumn 2021 uh, now address Crimean Human Rights Group and say that they lost uh, the contacts with their children uh, since uh, the beginning of the march, and they believe that they are involved in military actions uh, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, 
now we we witness that uh, hundreds of funerals uh, uh, in Crimea and most most of them uh, are uh, Ukrainian citizens and the hospitals are full of wounded and uh, tomorrow uh, the new uh, drafting campaign will start uh, in Crimea and uh, at least 3000 uh, Crimeans will be uh, sent to the war of Ukraine and uh, without doubt they will use it uh, primarily because uh, it's a great opportunity for them to get rid of uh, Ukrainian population, because those uh, who are 18, 19 years old now, they still remember what is U Ukraine because uh, they lived in free country and they they remember what is uh, to, to live in free country. And uh, it's just a great opportunity for them uh, to realize their, their policy of replacing the population in Crimea. And those uh, who, are, who are younger now, they are still are uh, under the severe uh, war propaganda and uh, unfortunately i can speak about it on my own experience uh, as uh, i have friends uh, pro-ukrainian family and their child was only one year old at uh, time of uh, the occupation and even at the level of the uh, kindergarten he was he became a victim of uh, war propaganda because at the age of five uh, a few years ago uh, when uh, uh, Russia uh, just organized uh, 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 military propaganda in Sevastopol and uh, just took uh, uh, a train, a propaganda train with trophies from Syria in, in Sevastopol, then they just uh, passed passed by uh, this event, uh, this young child, then they saw this military vehicles, uh, he asked, oh, it's our Russia who won the war. So he, he's already understanding what is the war at the age of five. Uh, he knows who is Putin, he likes Russian flag. And a uh, few years later at the first, the first grade at school, their first task was just to draw the Russian flag and uh, uh, to picture, to make a picture of uh, their, their own city. And uh, the picture which was drawn by this kid was uh, a military submarine. So he's, he's just uh, thinking, uh, thinking of, of war uh, just from, from the first two years of his life. And we understand that the more time uh, Crimea uh, stays under the occupation, the more soldiers uh, Putin will uh, have against the free world. And that's why the theme of Crimea is uh, still important. Uh, and uh, we understand that we have more important issues and we also involved in documenting war crimes uh, in the whole part of Ukraine. And our team member was drafted to the armed forces and continues his fight for Ukraine and Crimea on the battlefield. But the theme of Crimea is still important and should be uh, on the agenda of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lydia. I think, um, mm -hmm a sobering and somber reminder of um, crimes which are occurring, which may be less obvious to those at the outside, but which nonetheless have been perpetrated uh, from 2014 onwards. Thank you to the panelists and to the interventionists. And now let's move to a Q&A. I think we've got 20 minutes left and I'm sure that there'll be plenty of questions for our distinguished guests. Um, do we have any questions? Um, I'm working from my phone, so I might have to ask somebody to read out the questions for me. Apologies. Yeah, there is one question, Wayne, for Professor Newton. Professor Newton, do you see the question? If you click on question and answer button. I don't even see that. Just read the question to me. Thanks to the 
Uh, so, Professor Newton, I found compelling your comments regarding humanity's common heritage being represented in international criminal law. Please comment further on the optional role of force, particularly military force, in enforcing international law, especially pre-conflict rather than post-conflict, and the cultural changes, political and institutional, that may be required to acclimate the US and other militaries to that role? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of pieces there. Let me be brief and sort of explaining how I see that based on my own experience with lots of different militaries. The first piece is to remember, and this I think is important picking on, on the Baroness's comments, that the law of armed conflict, humanitarian law is designed from the ground up to balance the ability to win a, win a war. It's not, it, it, it enables effective war fighting when it's applied properly, but it also completely validates professional standards and the protection of civilians. And, and part of the reason for that is the simple humanitarian imperatives. But the bigger reason, which goes to the question, is the ability to, to have a long-term sustainable peace. You know, some of the oldest rules in humanitarian law, for example, uh, relate to the, uh, the obligation not to destroy farmland and the means of su subsistence for the civilian population and the uh, uh, poisoning of wells and things like that. So what I'd say is that in, in the cultural changes you have to, in, within the militaries, you have to refer, revert back to the core professional messages, which in my experience are, are, are pretty much there. At the political level though, um, there's this whole field of use post bellum. I think we have to be very clear what kind of peace we want and how we fight the war, how we conduct the war, how we conduct these tribunals, how does that fit into the larger term vision of a sustainable peace? And, you know, again, this is something that is in the literature that in my experience, we get, we get short circuited on in actually building a sustainable peace. And that's what I mean by the common heritage of mankind. Uh, you know, peace and the preservation of peace and the preservation of human rights, all of us share that goal. And so um, I think we have to be very deliberate in designing a strategic approach towards sustainable peace in the, in the literature, we call that use post bellum. Uh, it's not enough to use apply, apply proportionality correctly, but uh, proportionality, as I've written, has a very deliberate focus on what kind of peace we want to build. And I know, you know there's much more to say, and I'm happy to take emails as well. Thank you, Professor Newton. Do we have any more questions? It doesn't look like. Can I ask a question of my friends and colleagues on the panel, Wayne? Dear Wayne, please switch on your your microphone, you're muted. Ah, okay, please, please do, Professor Newton. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that the flows are happening so quickly and people are being moved in so many different directions. We had sort of some success with tracking people, getting evidence into databases, making that evidence then available uh, whether it's eyewitnesses or sworn affidavits, et cetera. Um, where are we failing right now in doing that systematically? And where would you all like to see specific focus from governments that care and from investigators in helping people get their testimony, get their eyewitness testimony, get their affidavits in a consolidated place that, that can then be used as opposed to just generalized good wishes? What can we do to help with that? Maybe I, I will start. Yeah, yes, go, go ahead, Alexandra. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to establish um, systems during the war, uh, but we are in process and a lot of other, our colleagues are also doing the same. 
I personally know three volunteers initiatives who collect from the open sources through OSINT met methodology, the photos and videos, which can probably be used uh, as such kind of evidence. Uh, also, as I told, we created a global initiative uh, tribunal for Putin and now working throughout Ukraine and um, uh, in chronological order to uh, trying to restore each episode since 24 of February according and using the frame of Article 8 of Rome Statute. So I'm sure that sooner or later, uh, we will be able to create these systems to cooperate with each other, to build connections between different volunteers and professional initiatives who do, the, who do this work. But uh, the question which worried me for current moment is not only how to document this for crimes, but how to stop it now. Because all this international justice is delayed in time, but people are dying now. People are suffering now. So I think that the, our priority for current moment has to be also what we as a human rights defender and human rights lawyers have to do in order to stop Putin. Because all negotiation which is going on for current moment, it's imitation of negotiation. It's not lead to peace uh, until Putin will not feel that he has to pay a too high price for this invasion. So, I encourage us not to think only about documentation. It's important and we do it, but how we can jointly do something in order to strengthen international pressure to Russia, to Russian economy, to uh, Putin and his surrounding and stop the new war crimes to emerge. Once again, uh, my main concern as a human rights defender who have been working on documentation for more than eight years, that all this mechanism will not help us to return human lives. I spoke with more than hundreds of people during these years who survived in captivity, who were beaten, who were raped, whose fingers were cut, who were tortured with electricity, whose eyes were pulled out with spoon. And I, I share my frustration because during when I provide these testimonies with such kind of people, another people at the same time are tortured in the same horrible methods. So we have to make a clear prioritization that the enormous part of our efforts has to be um, transferred in order to stop, stop Putin and to stop these war crimes. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, Roman, would you like to comment on that? I'd be interested to see what truth hounds uh, think about uh, what Alexandra's just said and the immediate concerns and priorities of your organization. I totally agree with Alexandra of what she said. Uh, speaking about the particular efforts re-documenting, I would support words of many panelists have already expressed about planting the investigation of as many cases as we can in many jurisdictions across the world and to pick some particular cases trying to dig deep and investigate them to establish linkage between the uh, alleged crime and the victims and the uh, available evidence to the alleged perpetrator to prepare a dossier and then pursue investigators in Poland, in Germany, in France, in, uh, in Argentina, in, in Japan, in South Korea, anywhere in the world to show that the planet itself opposes these atrocities and that the planet is united to stop the aggression and to stop the horrible international crimes being committed during this invasion. So maybe one of the uh, like resources that Ukrainian human rights defenders are lack is the uh, this investigators who can who can pick the evidence collected by the documenters who like, collect evidence who interview people and to put it into the case and prepare a dossier and then the advocacy efforts to start investigation and to make it public that 
many countries, as many as we can, to encourage has opened cases and are investigating them. Thank you very much, Roman. We've got uh, one more question, um, which maybe is uh, in the first instance for Alex. And the question is, um, what about making agreements with hosting refugee states to collect evidence in a legally internationally um, recognized way? Um, Alex, I think you mentioned during your presentation that that's uh, work you are doing, or at least uh, related work. Would you like to comment on that? Thank you, Wayne. Uh, yeah, I'll try to address uh, that question and, and, and the previous one, and, and also something that uh, Baroness Kennedy uh, mentioned. Um, so, the dream, if I if I could be as bold as to dream, is to create a kind of single repository of evidence, uh, which would be supported financially and in terms of legitimacy and authority by the international community, which was hosted by an international organization, perhaps the UN, perhaps the ICC, it doesn't really matter. Unfortunately, that dream uh, is hitting, uh, you know, a very hard edged reality in that there is, whether we like it or not, turf wars. Uh, the ICC already, a uh, prosecutor has already made it very clear that uh, he doesn't see much of a role for civil society uh, in, the, in, in, in this uh, documentation process, or at least uh, that's what we understood. Um, uh, there is sort of, there are all these initiatives, well, very well-meaning initiatives, uh, you know, technology and expertise uh, from people and from groups of people. And this is really great. Uh, what we need is, um, I guess, someone to organize this all of these efforts into a single effort and for everybody to agree on protocols in a way that we can all you know that we we all agree that the, the way that we collect the evidence uh is sound and will be admissible and so on and so forth there are many manuals there are many but you know we don't need new manuals there, there, there's lots of this about we just all need to agree uh to, on establishing as a, you know, a single repository of evidence, which we can then, as uh, as was said before by uh, by Professor Newton, we, we could then use for all sorts of um, legal processes, but be it at the ICC or domestic jurisdiction. Now, in the absence of this, what we are doing with Truthhounds, with with IPHR, with some other uh, with uh, organisations from each bordering state, is we are screening. We're not interviewing, but we're screening. Uh, uh, victims and witnesses at the moment, now, uh, and creating a database. Um, and the importance of this is one: we're 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 not we're trying to avoid that that situation, that scenario that that you were talking about, uh, Wayne, about the, the same witness being interviewed 32 times, uh, and therefore that uh, those that evidence being contaminated. We're also we want to create a, a database of potential witnesses uh, on on. Situations which we might not be aware of at the moment, but in the future, which will become pertinent, so that we could come back to this uh, database and say, oh, actually, on this day, at this time, in this place, we have these 10 people who were there. So maybe maybe we should get back in touch with them and see. And, and, and we have the technology to do this. Uh, you know, the, te the technology is available. Uh, there, there are many different brands of it, uh, of, uh, of, you know, case fleet and case map and uh, all, all these different um, uh, sort of evidence processing um, software that, that are used. You know, we use case fleet, but, but others use, use case metrics and so on and so forth. What we need, I guess, uh, now is, uh, is is someone to take initiative, uh, someone with authority and respect to take initiative, uh, not to lead, but to unify uh, all these efforts and to redistribute the resources in exactly where they're needed uh, to the prosecutors in Ukraine and Poland and Lithuania and so on to support them in, 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 in bringing cases, you know, uh, building uh, prosecution case. Uh, uh, experts in uh, be, for experts to be sent to, to Ukraine to, to investigate uh, or support investigations by civil society and so on and so forth uh, for people to work with 
uh, in advocacy, we want to work with, uh, with with political groups and, and and parties and political leaders to support all this, uh, all, all, all these efforts. And of course, of course, of course, uh, as uh, has been mentioned many times, to also support humanitarian efforts, as well as political solutions and uh, uh, and support for for Ukraine, Ukrainian military. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alex. Uh, what one more question? I think we've just got time, uh, and the question is, and I think it's it's probably one of the thornier questions um, of uh, documentation and international and national justice efforts, which um, is if everyone can access the data and the reports of human rights violations, how do you essentially keep the data secure or and I'll add this bit myself, how do you keep the witnesses um, and um, vulnerable witnesses particularly secure if everyone has access to uh, the data? Um, I don't know who wants to have a stab at that I, perennial I will, question. I will Go start because unfortunately I have to leave uh, very soon this event. Uh, we, as I told, uh, started the documentation since 2014. So uh, for, we have a lot of years for in order to establish a protocol of security of, uh, uh, of evidence, security of uh, witness and security of victims. Uh, now we use uh, all uh, uh, these um, materials and, uh, which, prepared, which were prepared beforehand. And also we use a specialized uh, um, database uh, to collect all this uh, and to, uh, to preserve all this evidence which is in secure place uh, and uh, with all um, defense elements which is which is needed according to international standards thank you um anyone else want to answer that yeah let me give just a quick thought and then i i said earlier i have to run um at, at like in two minutes so this will be brief um i don't think it's appropriate that you know, as the question assumed that everybody has access to all evidence all the time. I, it's, it's exactly the opposite, that there needs to be a clearinghouse to move evidence, um, much as a tube station would move a vehicle from a particular place to another place, a clearinghouse, if you will, um, and organizations are then requested. And we do, we've done this in other settings in Sierra Leone and of course the ad hocs, you know, the analogy would be Article 72 in the ICC, that that Roman owns that evidence and it's only used in a way and at a time that protects his and, and his victim's interests. By the same token, that evidence needs to be available to prosecutors all around the world. And that's that clearinghouse function that I was saying, because I've seen the exact opposite, where I knew there was good evidence in a particular place and uh, an organization simply refused to release it or refused to allow it to be used. So we, we have to have that function that works both ways. Organizations are willing to share um, with particular prosecutors and particular requests for particularized purposes, but they have to do it in a way that protects the interests of victims. And, and I think that's, we know how to do that. We just have to go do it. Thank you, uh, uh, Mike. Uh, I think we've just got time for Baroness Kennedy, who's raised her hand, and then we'll have to wrap up. Uh, thank you, everyone. No, I, I, I really just wanted to say what Michael in a way just said, which is that you, you have a central repository um, and then a, a mechanism where people apply in order to access it for particular cases where they're, they're wanting to, to, to do it. But, but we've had the experience in dealing with the Yazidi uh, um, cases um, and where we're we're seeking to to take that forward into into some sort of international domain. Um, we've had difficulty, which is that um, some people want to hold on to the particular evidence that they've secured, and not get. And so it's very important to to be collaborative from the outset, if you possibly can, uh, so that people don't then feel that somehow proprietorial, and they feel that perhaps they haven't been included enough at an earlier stage and so on and so then it, it takes a lot of goodwill late to, to try later to try to get people to be collaborative so getting people to be collaborative from early on would be great but i think it, it's very important that ukrainians are at the heart of of uh, 
of this decision making process. I really do. Thank you very much. And I think that's a great um, moment to uh, finish the panel. Um, the Ukrainians must stay at the heart of uh, the problem and the solution. Um, and uh, as is very clear from the panelists, there's a lot of work ahead. There's a lot of complicated but essential work ahead. We must collaborate. We must take our guide from the Ukrainians and hopefully we can move the dial forward in terms of justice and accountability for the Ukrainian people. So on that note, thank you to Roman, to Alexandra, to Alex, to Professor Newton, to Lucy, to Baroness Kennedy and Vladimir. Thank you very much. I'm sure you'll all agree uh, what great speakers they've been and how much we've learned during this session. Thank you very much.